we will hear from Anela vasilos uh, stories from the trenches about fluid teams. Have fun. So, hi all. Uh, my name is Ornella, and I work as an Agile coach in a company called Vinted. So, uh, Vinted is on a very ambitious mission to make a consumption more sustainable by uh, making a second-hand fashion a primary choice. Um, while the mission itself is ambitious, we have a lot of challenges going there, quite a lot of opportunities. And uh, I tried to contribute to, to that journey by helping teams to accelerate towards that mission. And the fluid teams is uh, one of the approaches, one of the opportunities that we're currently exploring in our organization to make that acceleration happen. So we've been working with this experiment for over a year. And my talk today is to report back a little bit of what have we learned, what kind of experiences we have, hoping that maybe this uh, contribution to the topic will help some other people to uh, explore uh, try these different approaches, and maybe also help to accelerate the journey in their own missions. Uh, before we go to these stories from the trenches, I want to do a very quick check-in. Uh, then preparing for this talk, I reflected on my own relationship with the topic of uh, fluid teams. And I realized that, I don't know, like a few years ago, I was really a skeptic of the idea of the fluid teams. For Many years, like all the literature that I would read, I uh, would talk about stable, long-lived te teams that are required to build a trust and psychological safety, which is prerequisite for high team performance. Uh, this heuristic was really strong. I don't even think that I approached it as a heuristic. For me, it was more like a hardcore fact. Um, and I, I was really cynical about at anything that would talk about some different approaches, I felt like it's a project management, project mindset in disguise. Um, and anything that would come in, uh, in the subject, I would greet with a certain um, reservations or with a certain cynicism. So I really want to invite you to check in if that's where you are right now. If you feel like fluid teams is a scam, someone's trying to trick you, that's not the way we should go. So if that's how you feel right now, please raise your hand. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's really, really important to be challenged. It's really important to maintain that critical outlook and uh, not get into the hype or into the trend and not uh, over-index on some novelty aspects. So I'm really glad that there are people who are uh, critically supporting the, uh, the idea of stable, long-lived teams. Then, uh, after a while, um, something hits me. It was like it was a ha moment where I start noticing that my own experiences does not necessarily map the stable, long-lived teams. I myself have moved from one team to another. I've been working in some other, you know, side gigs where I had to move into the team really fast, spend there a little bit time, time move out. And I realized that doesn't, that doesn't fit the stable long-lived team approach. However, I was still able to create that trust and psychological safety that led to the high performance. Um, I also learned that Sticking to this ideal of stable, long-lived teams really creates this unnecessary friction. Because when environment change and you have no other option but either split your team or move different direction, um, you kind of feel uh, trapped. Because on one hand, you're trying to optimize for stability and longevity. On the other hand, it's not a pragmatical choice in a given context. So. Reflecting on my own experiences after the um, strong belief in a stable, long-lived teams vanished, I got really, really curious. Okay, so if this is my experience, and there are other people talking about these experiences, maybe I could just learn a bit more. Maybe I could learn about the concept itself, get more familiar with what it is about. And then it was my second stage of like discovering the concept itself. 
not really practicing, but just getting a bit more open to that idea, trying to, you know, grab the information there and there to educate myself. So if you feel like you resonate to this part of my journey, and you are here because you are curious, not necessarily to try it out, but just to learn what it is, uh, please raise your hand. Cool, thank you. Um, and now, after being a practitioner of this approach for over a year now, um, I have some challenges, I have some questions, and I need uh, information that is more specific, more solution-oriented. Like, what were the challenges other teams had? Have we dealt with it? How can I improve my own practice? And it became more, you know, uh, practical advice, practical implications, things like that. So, if that's where you feel like you are right now, please raise your hand. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you all. I do hope that every one of you will get something out of this talk. Um, now, why do I choose to talk about this? Um, I think that the stable and long-lived team heuristic is a bit of a dangerous area. I'm not saying that stable long-lived teams do not work. I don't say that you know, fluid teams suppress or like is a, a superior approach in comparison to the stable long-lived teams. But I think that in certain contexts, fluid teams could be a better approach. And uh, because of certain negative connotation to it, certain biases against it, it's a little bit more difficult to get information. So there is a little bit of that information around. The topic picked up a few years ago. Maybe it was there a long time ago. I was just not aware. Um, but still, when I was doing my own research, I found that there's little uh, scientific evidence for fluid teams. Then we talk about high-performing uh, performing teams. A bunch of these studies are really you know, beating it to one gate, like, no, you need time to build that. Um, and while there are practitioners who share their experiences or report on the experiences of others, I still feel like fluid teams is a bit of an underdog in the sense. And I think it's a little bit of a uh, problem, because if it's a good fit to certain context, and we could learn a little bit more how to make it an effective, how, how can we use it better, maybe we could all you know, benefit out of it. So that's why I think it's important to contribute my own experiences to, to the community, to the people who are either skeptics or interested or actually practicing by themselves, to maybe help that, uh, on that journey for this particular topic. So I mentioned that context is really important, and I'd like to share a little bit about what is our context that forced us to explore fluid teams as a potential improvement uh, or potential, uh, good, potentially good approach uh, in our situation. So, as I mentioned, we have high ambition, right? The high ambition comes hard to hit uh, goals. The hard to hit goals comes, we need a lot of brain power. The, the complexity of the industry growing, the complexity of the software growing, I notice that there's more and more specialization. Like, uh, in Vinted, we rely a lot on, on data, and even in this function of data, we already have three different roles. We have a data engineer, we have a decision scientist, we have design, uh, uh, data scientists who do machine learning models, etc. So even in one function, we already have a lot of specialization. And if in the area where you work, you need all of these different skills, the team can grow really, really fast, really, really big. And then, typically, you would cut out some function and say, now you provide some sort of service, but then it leads to some sort of handoffs, and handoffs leads to delays, and it doesn't help us to go to that direction where we want to go uh, fast. So, um, with this fast-changing environment, with this growing complexity, we realized that we cannot really be good at everything, and we need to re really reassess what we are optimizing for. And while doing this, we realized that there are three aspects that could potentially be levers that we can pull to be more successful in the context that we work in. 
Uh, one of those levers is focus. Uh, when I say focus, I mean our ability to focus on key opportunities. The landscape is vast. There are a bunch of opportunities that we can pick. If we try to spread ourselves too thin, we will not make an impact, so it's really important to focus on key opportunities. If we select the key opportunities we want to focus on, it's really important to mobilize our efforts so that we hit that target really, really hard instead of doing that one important thing, but then those other things that are also important, and then the effort is getting scattered as well. So focusing our effort in an effic uh, efficient way to really hit, uh, hit uh, the goals that we set ourselves. And then the last one is flexibility. While then we set our eye on the target, we want to move towards that direction quite fast, we also know that those targets may change. Something may happen. Something in the industry, something in uh, technical innovation, something like, uh, you know, COVID, things like that. And uh, for that, we need, really need to be um, flexible when we are assessing those opportunities. Be very critical if these opportunities that we're currently focusing is still relevant. And uh, if we cannot really go to, from point A to B in a fast fashion, uh, faster than the change is happening, it means that we will leave a lot of work behind, unfinished, uh, which is not ideal. So we thought that these are good things for us to optimize for. Um, however, today I'm going to focus a little bit more on this flexibility aspect. So again, when I talk about flexibility by design, there are a few things that I have in mind. So first of all is uh, treating all of our hypotheses as experiments, like really doubling down on this inspect and adapt feedback loop. Because while we want to maintain focus and we want to maintain our efforts aligned towards that uh, goal or that focus, we also need to learn quite fast that focus is not relevant or the efforts that we are putting are not bringing the, the value that we expect. Another aspect of flexibility by design is how we uh, architect our code base. So we have very rigid, hard to change code base. It doesn't help us to move faster. Um, and we want a certain level of modular, uh, modularity in the code, in the architecture, so we would have those components easily movable around. And the thing that I will focus on today is flexibility by design in a team design. So this is uh, what we think when we think about team design at, at one of the teams that I work at Vinted. So before I start telling how we change that design, I want to start from telling how the design was before. Um, in a way, I would, co would call it as a stock image in a frame. We, f we thought of the teams as a pretty standard package. Um, you have a certain disciplines together, you have an engineering manager, product director, design and analytics, then you have uh, each of uh, front-end cap uh, capacities, cap capabilities like Android, iOS, web, then you have a couple of backends and a QA. That's already quite a big team. But that was like... Uh, pretty much a standard approach. Like, if we want to invest in this new area, we just launch our stock package team and, you know, send them to, to that particular uh, area to work on. Um, in a way, it was a quite good approach for some time. While complexity was not as high and the challenges were rather similar, where you can make an impact with pretty standard set of people, um, it was working quite all right. But with that complexity growing, and with, uh, with the scale where we realized that it's not even about how we design our teams, it's, it's also about how we perceive the value that we have, uh, have to deliver. Like, think of team topologies, right? Uh, what is the shared capabilities, like uh, platform teams, for example, which is um, something that you want to uh, uh, provide the same service for multiple teams, right? Uh, and there are these uh, stream-aligned teams that work, uh, focuses on value delivery. And if you think how different those teams are, you understand that the same setup doesn't really work that well. So we took very critical look 
and uh, our simplified team design, uh, we took a very critical look in what is the result of having this team design. And what we learned is that if we have teams that are very constrained by its design, they get very constrained with the goals that they can accomplish. They will select the ambition for themselves that they can do with the people that they have. If they are getting a bit more ambitious and saying, well, in our scope there are these opportunities and they get to hire more people, the team grows too big and then they cannot really effectively work as a single team because we stand up with 12 people each talking about their own thing that they have been doing and not collaborating. It's not really a good stand-up. Um, and we had these challenges that felt like there's little that we can do if we do not revisit how we design our teams. So for that, we just make this pretty easy flip. Uh, well, easy in, in paper, right? It's, uh, just swapping few words. So if you have read anything about teams, the most common, very abstract team description is a group of people working on a specific goal or a shared goal, right? So there's a group of people component and there's this shared goal component in, in the team definition. And while we were over-indexing on stability and longevity, over-indexing on group of people aspect of teams, we really were not able to hit the goals as effectively as we would want to. So we decided to make that flip and say that, first of all, we agree on what the purpose is. Like, what is the goal? And then this purpose becomes a container to which the right composition, right amount of people can flow. Now, the size element doesn't change, right? If we still have, you know, we define the purpose first and then we get people, what happens if the amount of people who need to contribute to make that purpose uh, achieved is way too big? That's where we decide that we need to create few layers of the teams. And we split those layers in, based on two aspects. So the first one is what the team owns, and then the other one is what the team does. So what the team owns, we use a DDD and the def definition of like subdomains to clarify the boundaries, the area in which we expect team to have an impact. It includes both solution and the problem space. It includes both having the code ownership, well, we call it code stewardship, uh, as well as uh, doing discovery activities, finding the opportunities in the defined boundaries of the subdomain. And this is a primary team. So subdomain, as a primary guidelines for the team, is as stable as a subdomain can be. So subdomain can be really stable, but it can also be rather flexible itself. If it's an area where you want to double down your investment, most probably you will find more opportunities, most probably you will find a, a good cut for that subdomain. Some subdomains may um, decrease in their imp importance, and that does not make any more sense to keep as many people focusing on that particular subdomain. So importance of the subdomain and the size of the subdomain and the discovery of these subdomains is what kind of sets the tone of how stable our primary teams are. And some are quite stable, but then in, in the other areas where we just start exploring the opportunity space, we expect that subdomain boundary to change also quite often. So this is the first layer of how we approach uh, our team composition. So subdomain, as an area of ownership and the primary team where we also uh, attached all the um, organizational hierarchy to it. So if we have, and our subdomains are typically five to 20 people. So all of those five to 20 people would report if they are engineers to engineering manager on a subdomain level. And that frees, frees us to do mission teams um, separately from this uh, organizational hassle of creating this additional organizational structure. And the mission teams are the what-we-do types of teams. 
Um, the freedom that we had, the, the mission team separated from subdomains, was not only about uh, organizational hierarchy, which is typically something that it takes a bit more time to create. Um, it also allowed us to create missions that are cross-cutting the boundaries of the specific subdomains. It also enabled us to create teams that are focusing on some functional improvements. So talking about the same data people, they need to make operational tooling improvements that would affect the whole group. And uh, if we scatter these efforts, just giving each data person in each of the subdomains one task to be done, they're not really collaborating. That's not a first-class citizen in our roadmaps. And we are not effectively improving the, the tooling that is essential for us to keep that focus on quality, get better at how we do things, how we use tools. So having this flexibility in missions also allowed us to have these more cross-cutting boundaries teams without any organizational hazard of creating the functional hierarchy there. Um, so to sum up, we went from very static stock image type of team that we would just launch as a default setting into thinking of the purpose for the team first and separating the ownership from the action and introducing subdomain as a team as well as mission team that has a more like granular uh, outcome or output that they are focusing on. Um, after we did all that, there are some of the nice things that have happened. We were pretty happy about the first results. So one of the most important things was that shifting our focus towards the purpose really allowed us to be more transparent about that purpose. If we looked at the teams as a, some sort of you know, building block or a unit that makes work happen, there was a lot of um, hidden activity within that team that we not necessarily uh, align with a broader organization, would not necessarily align with other teams. They would be very silenced in that way. But now, since the purpose discussion is the first step for us to design the team, we started to pay more attention. We started to see more explicitly what are, the, uh, what are the areas we want to invest in? Um, also, being a bit more critical than we want to invest in multiple, uh, multiple areas, having the capacity constraints. It becomes more of a friction for us to take more than we can chew. So that was one of the uh, benefits. We were able to manage our investments with more transparency and on a higher level. Um, the other important aspect was that then we had a smaller group of people focusing on a specific mission, the amount of time it takes to complete that mission drastically reduced. It's like, you know, you remove as much of the distractions as you possibly can, and you, say, say, you ask people to focus on this one thing. And, well, I think it's very intuitive to think that if you only do one thing, you will do it faster. So that was our case as well. Just proved the lean you know, approach. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the flexibility to create those mission teams that cuts uh, through the boundaries of the organizational hierarchy and the defined subdomains also allowed us to tackle that work that we were not able to do before. That was something that caused us severe pain and frustration, something that many people saw as like, this is super important for us to do, but then if we want to do it, and then we need to align the backlogs of five teams, uh, it will not happen. So this flexibility also helped us to do things that we were not as effective as doing, uh, at doing before. Um, and all of that, is something that is of interest to managers. So most of our managers are pretty happy with what we've done. Um, it's a little bit of a different story when we come to the teams. 
When we come to the teams and when we come to other implications of switching the model from more stable long-lived teams into fluid teams, there are so many things that I did not expect to happen. There are so many conversations that I did not expect to have. And this list of struggles, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the things that I managed to, you know, extract from the top of my head. Uh, some of them are really can be attributed to the uh, design change that we made. So the, the mission team pattern, we used uh, what is uh, in some areas known as isolation pattern or innovation by isolation. The concept that we borrowed from the uh, book Dynamic Reteaming. Um, and as it's mentioned in its name, isolation pattern creates certain isolation. While we were saying that a subdomain is a primary team, that's not how people felt. People felt like where you do the work is your primary team. Focusing on this purpose, focusing on the ownership, was not really the strong muscle. It's not something that we were really, by default, good at. Uh, people were more task-oriented. Ownership area, purpose, that's a different abstraction level. It's a higher abstraction level. So not everyone in the team felt like they can connect to that. So building this um, identity on a subdomain level um, was a bigger challenge than we actually anticipated. So isolation can be definitely attributed to the design cho choice that we made. Uh, sense of stability, again, one of these things that we can definitely attribute to the change that we made. Uh, when we just introduced that change, and we introduced a change granularly, so first we did the one-quarter experiment with one team, and then from the beginning of the year we scaled it in our domain, which is currently five teams, five subdomains. So, um, some of the people, when we were just presenting the model, said that, well, um, it's not what I want to have. I want to have very clear backlog for upcoming years so I would know what I will be working on. This uh, uh, uncertainty of the teams, that uh, pressure of getting along with more people is not something that I really want. That's not the environment where I could be successful. And that sense of stability is also something that we uh, failed to introduce on a subdomain level. Because then, again, people didn't have that emotional attachment to the subdomain as their primary team. We were more um, getting attached to the mission team, which was temporary, and that, that caused the sense, uh, lack of sense of stability. And the same goes for the sense of belonging. Because we were not able to create a strong identity around the subdomain um, as, a, as a primary team, people felt like they don't have home, like they don't belong. They work for a little bit in this mission team, and then they have to move to a different mission team. Well, in reality, they would most of the time work with the same people, right? Because pretty much 80% of the missions that we had were missions within the boundary of the same subdomain. And when we did the change, there were little changes in between the um, team members. There was like less than 20% of the people who changed the, their initial area of work and had to work with new co colleagues or had a new manager. But this um, uh, d diluted uh, aspect of the team as a subdomain did not allow them to create that new sense of belonging. So these three things, I'd say, can be justifiably be attributed to the design choice that we made. Well, we tried to counteract these. Well, we knew that some of these things will happen and really tried to um, support this change by introducing certain um, guidelines or patterns. So um, when we talk about the mission teams, we provided the mission briefs to create a clarity. Uh, then we uh, created the subdomain as a pattern. We also kind of referred to all the TDD work that we all uh, have done before. Um, 
we communicated extensively about this change, the reasons for it, and the design, and uh, uh, and we suggested how the subdomains could operate to actually uh, create that subdomain level identity. We provided the toolkits to kick off with mission teams quite fast that focused a lot on creating this relationship with the mission teams. Um, but I think the sentiment that some people had was a bit detached from the actions that we take. To some extent, it felt like we're making all of these actions with no effect. And uh, I think we uh, underestimated the, the size of the change. Right? Again, as I said in the beginning, the flip was really simple. The flip was from group of people to goal, shared goal. We flipped it. Shared goal first come, comes first, and then we talk about the group of people who had work on it. But that was not an experience many of our colleagues have before. So even with our best efforts, the sentiment was coming from way, way, way deeper experiences and deeper beliefs. And then there was a bunch of other struggles that we had. So, for example, prioritization. As I mentioned, we got a bit more transparency in the investments that we make, and that it uh, forced us to be more critical about how we choose those investments. It required us to be more explicit on what do we say yes to and what do we say no to. And the lack of comprehensive prioritization practices across our teams caused a lot of confusion. So it felt like, you know, it's a manager who's saying which missions we should run. Uh, it felt like the lack of transparency on how we make these prioritization decisions is causing a bit even more uh, problems to the engagement of the teams. They already have to go through this change that someone else like forced on them. Uh, despite our best efforts, we don't want to be there. And then the prioritization is unclear, and then we end up in the mission that we didn't want to be in. And I wouldn't say that prioritization as a challenge was uh, a straight correlation from the design change that we made. I think that was just the organizational debt that we already had. I think that prioritization discipline can be improved isolated from your team design choice. But what has happened is that the team design choices that we made really exposed the weaknesses that we already had in the system. So we had to work better on aligning how we prioritize so the prioritization would be um, removed from the hierarchy so we would have a transparent and uh, uh, fair prioritization that everyone understands in the same way. Uh, another aspect that we were really, really excited about and really believed that will help with the team engagement on motivation was self-selection. So we really tried hard to make sure that whenever we define subdomain boundaries, we allow people to choose which subdomain we want to belong to. And then we launch new missions. We also wanted people to choose to which missions they want to contribute to. But then self-selection is again, was not a thing that people have experienced before, or so they thought. Uh, then we look into hackathons, for example. That's a great example where self-selection just happens naturally without anyone giving too extensive of the guidelines how to do it. So this happens when we have a hackathon. All of our teams are very, very fluent in self-selecting, and then they are getting engaged and motivated because we work on a mission or like a hack that we want to work on. So in theory, having a mission team and self-selection in that context should be no different, but it was dramatically different. And to this date, I still have not have a good answer how to do the self-selection. Now we're looking into options, and one of those options is actually to, uh, to do more of the hackathons, to uh, start the missions or creation of a mission uh, be more like a hackathon, so that people could actually uh, like remove that context of the organizational change that we do, uh, did and give them something that they are familiar with, the hackathon format that they are familiar with, hoping to uh, 
hoping that this will um, allow them to see this thing in the familiar context. But again, even with all these intentions that we had, self-selection that didn't happen out of the box, and we need to kind of double down and figure out the better ways to uh, include people and uh, um, deciding their own faith. Ownership. Um, as I mentioned, we struggled with this um, abstraction level of ownership within the subdomain, of the code's uh, ownership as well. Uh, people were very, uh, very good at owning the task that we do. There are zero problems with that. If there is a task and a task is assigned, I own that task, I will deliver it. Strong ownership there. But then if we talk about a little bit more abstract thing, about, like, this is a subdomain, this is the area. It's not only about the solution, it's not only about that feature that you're currently building, but it's also about the code that's already there that needs to be maintained. It's also about realizing what is the best strategy to move that area forward. It's also about realizing what type of uh, product is this? What type of subdomain is this? Is this a platform? Is this a value um, streamlined uh, uh, team? And people were not really getting it. They were like, what are you talking about? Like, I get a task, I do the task. That's ownership. Um, and I, again, I'd say that this is not something that I could directly associate with the design change that we made. Uh, it meant that in our previous setup, this weakness that we already had was not as exposed. And the change that we did that just exposed that the ownership, the sense of ownership, is really kind of isolated to only some members of the team. That not all members of the team feel the same sense of ownership. And then naturally they don't get this like a sense of belonging. The stability is also not there because you cannot attach it to the subdomain because you have, don't, don't have a sense of ownership around there. Self-selection is also like, why would you self-select for something that you don't own and you, and you don't really care about? So not necessarily directed to the design change that we made, but made us super <laughs> aware that there are so much things that we need to do in, in terms of improve uh, ownership. Um, Innovation was also one of the things mentioned by the team members. Uh, after we did this design change, we were like, now for everything I need to launch a mission. And it's a bureaucratic process. You need to fill a mission brief. And then I have this idea that I would be able to hack in three days, and now I'm not able to do so. Well, the other part of that story is that many of those hacks of three days, while very motivating and interesting to the people who do them, do not result in a productized version of it. Because actually to productize something, you need to go and align the others. And, and then people felt like, well, we are not able to innovate. We are not able to move the needle as fast as we used to, because now we have all of these constraints around us. Yes, by design. That's totally by design. And it's not in order not to have innovation. We still need to find good ways to, to create that space for proof of concept, for throwaway codes, from, for new ideas that we do not expect to, um, to productize immediately. But that's another form of investment. So if we are looking more critically into the investments that we make, naturally, everything everyone does gets more visibility. And when it gets more visibility, it gets more challenged. And if you are not able to stand your ground for why this is important, most probably will not get to do that. And this is, again, something that we need to have, find a better balance and better approaches how we in include innovation in a way that is aligned with the principles of us having a sharp focus, being aligned about the same uh, purpose. And, uh, um, and really being smart and intentional about how we do the innovation. Um, scoping was another big challenge. So when we have a mission team, we expect that to be very well targeted. 
it does not necessarily mean that we want missions, all of the missions, to be uh, short. There are certain areas of improvement that may require years and years of uh, iterations, years of years and explorations. But we want to be very explicit that we want to invest all that time in that one particular area. The sometimes even rather stable mission team working on it. But it still has to go through this uh, rigorous prioritization and reprioritization. And people struggled with scoping. While Mission Brief was uh, intended to help with that, with very specific mission milestones, due to this attitude that this is a bureaucratic process, people were not really kind of using it how it was designed. And that was a little bit sad. And then people say that, you know, there are all of these um, bullet points that I need to think about. There's all of questions about, like, what is the hypothesis that you're trying to test? How will you know that you are successful? And before that, they didn't have to do it. So it was really, like, task-oriented. You know, I do this, I get a fast reward from the task delivered, and I, then I throw it to someone else, and I hope that it made an impact. Now we were like, okay, if we... If we really want to make an impact, we really need to kind of measure if we did it. Um, what was it? Ten minutes? Five minutes. Perfection. Um, and then this muscle of effective scoping was also not in the, in the system yet. Even with these support mechanisms that we presented to the teams, we didn't see the intention of it. They only saw the bureaucracy. Again, not something that I would attribute as a side effect of the design choices that we made, more of the vulnerability or weakness that we already, already had in the, in the system. And then expectations and having clear expectations. We thought, because we were an agile team already, we thought that with self-organization, all of these things we already good at. But changing this one rule in the rule book made it clear that all of the other things that we've done were more of the uh, inertia and not really a choice. You know, you do things because you have used to do these things in that particular way, not really giving any thought that this is a good way. And the request for having everything written down, everything explained, everything refined uh, showed that the team is not really as disciplined as we expected them to be. So again, not something that I would attribute to the design change that we did, more like you know, being more exposed to the reality of the system. So with all of that experience, we were really confused we did pretty much everything that was in our control. We really prepared the change very well. We did the change management by the book, communicating, scaling it slowly, um, writing down and being very explicit. The change was really minima minimalistic. The, the swap, at least in our heads, was just a very nuanced one. But with all of that, we learned quite a lot about the challenges that we already had in our system. And I got really, really frustrated because I felt like I've been doing this already on a team level. I've been solving these problems already. Why am I getting into the same situation all over again? I thought that we have strong ownership, we are able to scope things, all of these things. And then my mentor and my manager, Alona, she said, Anella, it looks like we just took an elevator to the next floor, and here's the same problems just on the next level. And we get better by solving those problems over, over, over and again, and most probably we will get those problems again in a different floor. So it made me to see that we are actually making progress. Just the journey there is a bit different than I expected. And this journey is not over yet. Again, as I said, we, did, we are doing it for a bit more than a year now. And with all these struggles, one could ask, would it be easier to just go back? Well, it's like in a matrix. You have a choice to take a red or a blue pill, right? So I think that this change helped us to, this, to see the system more exposed, and I think it's a good thing. 
It's a daunting thing. It annoys me quite a lot seeing the same challenges over uh, again. But I think the reality is never as easy as you wish it to be. And it's super uncertain and super unclear. But it still is our belief that we need to continue this direction. Because being exposed to your own weaknesses helps to improve those and at those areas. And improving at those areas will help us to accelerate uh, our performance and reach the goals that we want to reach, even if those goals will change quite rapidly, and that the muscle that we will build as a team will be a stronger muscle. Because all of these things, like scoping, prioritization, they are independent disciplines. And it, it does not uh, depend as much on the context. If you're good at scoping, you will be good at scoping in a fluid team or in a stable team. If you're good at prioritization, you will do it effectively in both fluid teams and, and uh, stable teams. So that's the motivation for us to move in this direction. And I do hope that this uh, experience of mine is somewhat useful in your own context. And I'm really looking forward to hear more stories from your trenches about how you're dealing with uh, fluid teams, stable teams, changes in teams, and all around. Thank you. <laughs>